This is a short video about section 2.5.2 in Stein's number theory book, and it's about the existence of primitive roots. So to recall, we're going to be talking about the order of an element in a group. So the order of an element x in a finite group, remember that's the smallest natural number m, such that x raised to the nth power gives you back 1. And what we're going to show uh, in this section, 2.5.2, is that the group of units mod p, so z mod p z star, that it's a cyclic group. And remember that meant that there is an element um, whose order is the order of the whole group. Or another way to say that is there's one element uh, that can start taking powers of it to recover all the other elements in the group. And uh, the way that we're going to do that is in the following way. We're going to look at the elements in here and uh, we're going to try to produce an element of order d for any prime divisor d of the number p minus 1, so 1 less than this prime modulus here. And then the idea is, once I have an, order, an element of order d for each prime divisor d of p minus 1, I'm going to multiply all those together to get an element of order p minus 1. So that's the goal. I want to get an element of order p minus 1 in here. So let me just kind of show you, walk you through a concrete example of what this looks like. Let's take p equal to 7. So we're playing around in z mod 7 z star. So that's a z. And what is that? So that should be the numbers uh, 1 through 6. OK. And now what I want to have happen is, so p is 7. And uh, p minus 1 is equal to 6 then. We're going to look at the prime divisors of 6, which is 2 and 3. What we're going to try to do is find an element of order 2 and find an element of order 3. All right, so notice here that if you take 6, uh, well, 6 doesn't have order 1 since 6 is congruent to 6 mod 7, but 6 squared is 36, which is congruent to 1 mod 7. So that says 6 has order 2. And uh, what else do we see if I look at 2? So 2, 2 squared, or well, 2 to the 1 is 2. So that's this guy. 2 squared is 4. What about 2 cubed? 2 cubed is 8, which is congruent to 1 mod 7. So that says 2 has order 3. So order 3. So now what we should do is we just found an element of order d for each prime divisor d of 6. We just found an element of order 2 and order 3. What we're going to end up doing is just multiplying the two elements we just found, 6 and 2. And when I do that, so x equals 6 times 2, which is 12. When we reduce that mod 7, you get 5. 5 is our element of order 6. So 5 is a generator for this cyclic group. So 5 has order 6. So that's, again, the basic idea of what we're going to show um, in the main result of this section. So building up to that, um, what we need to do first is maybe a little lemma here to make sure that maybe I'm not taking anything for granted with how my exponent rules work. And so the first thing we'll look at is this lemma again. Let's say you have two elements of z mod nz star, where n could be composite. So we're pretty careful. p will be prime. Maybe n's composite. And let's say that a has order r, and let's say that b has order s. So remember, that means that r is the smallest exponent, so that a to the r is 1 in this group. And similarly, b to the s should give you 1, and no exponent smaller than s should do that. But let's suppose that these orders, r and s, are relatively prime well then the element a times b should have order r times s. So as long as these are relatively prime, the order of the product should be the product of the orders, is a slick way to say that. And so this is kind of nice. This should happen no matter what n is again. n could be composite, and that's fine. In some of the videos you've seen so far, you've seen some weird things can happen when n is composite, but maybe intuition or common sense kind of holds true as far as lemma 2.5.7 is concerned. So really all that we need is that in z mod nz star, I can multiply a times b is the same thing as b times a. It's commutative. So in particular, uh, what do I know? a times b, all raised to the rs power, that should be a to that power times b to that power, which again utilizes the fact that it's commutative. I won't go too much into de details there. But what do I know? Well, a to the r, r is the order of a, so that's 1. So that's 1 to the s. And similarly, b so the s is 1, so that's 1 to the r. So this is really uh, 1 to the s times 1 to the r, which is just 1. So what does that say? Well, that says that rs is definitely an exponent I can raise a b to in order to get 1. But remember, that doesn't necessarily mean that rs is the order of a b. So the order, though, by, say, Lagrange's theorem or Euler's theorem, um, the order of a b 
has to divide RS. So it's got to be smaller than or equal to RS, and it has to divide it. So what the rest of the proof is aimed at showing um, is, that, is that RS is, in fact, the smallest such number. So the order of AB is actually going to be equal to RS. But so far, I do know that the order divides RS. So let's actually write this out. So the order of AB, let's give it a name. Let's write this divisor as R1 times S1, where, what can I specify? R1 divides R, that's what we're saying here. And uh, S1, you guessed it, divides S. So what we're gonna do is we're going to raise both sides of our equation here. Um, so this equation here, so A to the R1S1 times B to the R1S1. That's the same thing as AB all to the R1S1. And remember, R1S1 is the order. That's why it equals 1 here. So we're going to take that equation, and we're going to raise it to the R divided by R1 power. And just for convenience, we're going to rename R divided by R1. We're going to call that R2. So when I do that, when I raise both sides to the R2 power, I think about my exponent rules. I should just stick an R2 with these guys, and of course, um, 1 to the R2 power is still just 1. So, so far we're here. Now what we're going to do is, we're going to think a little bit here. I'm going to focus on this piece right here. So A to the R1 S, goodness, R1 R2 times S1. Do some exponent rules to regroup them. That's A to the R1 times R2, all to the S1 here. And uh, what do I know then? I know that, well, uh, that has to be equal to 1 in this case. So then what does that imply? That tells me that if that's equal to 1, so this much that I've highlighted as 1 back in this equation right here, well then that tells me that what's, what's remaining also has to be equal to 1 here. Okay, and uh, by the way, like how do you know that that's 1? Maybe, maybe I skipped over that or glossed over that. How do I know that this is equal to 1 here, it's because what is R1 times R2? If you bring this R1 over to this side, R1 times 2, R2 is R. And remember, R is the order of A. That's how I know that this is really 1 to the S1 power, which is 1. So I hope that fills in why this is true. Anyway, so we're here. Now we just have to focus on this piece. So in particular, uh, what does that say? Well, S is supposed to be the order of B. And so in that case, I've got some other exponent that I can raise b2 to get 1. So s has to be smaller than that. Moreover, s has to divide this number here. So s divides this exponent that I can raise b2 to get 1. Now, what have I assumed so far? I know that the GCD of s and r1 times r2, which is the same thing as r, again, so I've, I've still got that highlighted, but I'll emphasize it right here, that says r is equal to r1 times r2. S and R are relatively prime by definition. So in particular, if, uh, if I highlight now, if S divides this product, R1, R2 times S1, S cannot divide R1, R2, therefore S has to divide S1. So what can we conclude? So he kind of jumps here to it follows that they're equal. What do I have? I know that S1 divides S, and what we just finished down here is that, in fact, S divides S1. So since I have both of these division relationships, the only way that could happen is if they're equal. And if those are equal, you could kind of logic out similarly that R and R1 have to be the same. Therefore, what the actual order of A times B is, it has to just be RS, is what we've just proved. Okay, moving along. So theorem 2.5.8, as it's about primitive roots. And uh, what are we gonna say? There is a primitive root modulo any prime so z mod pz star is a particularly nice group, and a way to say this in kind of a group theory language is that that group is cyclic. So remember, what we want to try to do is we want to try to find a generator for this group. In other words, a single element that can give me any other element just by taking powers. And one more way to think about that, a single element whose order is the order of the whole group. And uh, just uh, to remind you, the order of this group, since p is prime, remember it's always phi of p, the number of elements relatively prime to p. And remember, for a prime, that's just one less than the prime. So the order of this group is p minus 1. So we're going to be looking for an element of p minus 1 in a little bit. But right now, we're just showing that there exists a primitive root um, in p. And so uh, in this case, it's true if p is equal to 2. All right, Your primitive root uh, would just be uh, 1 in that case. And so let's assume p is a prime bigger than 2. So what we'll do then is p minus 1 
is not prime then, if p's prime, so p minus 1 should have a prime factorization, and into distinct prime powers here. So q1, q2, qr are all different, and then the n's are just the exponents uh, that each of those occur to. So let's say if this is something like, um, let's say 18, 18 I'm saying should be 2 to the, uh, what, I guess really, 2 squared times, or just 2 times 3 squared, goodness, that was hard for me to do. <laughs> Great, so like n1 is 1, uh, and n2 looks like it's 2. So I hope it makes sense how we're writing the prime factorization out. So earlier in a previous video, we showed that anything that looks like x to the d minus 1 has exactly d roots. And so I'm using that here. x to the qi to any of these prime powers should have x to, the, x to any of these prime powers minus 1. That polynomial should have however many of those uh, roots that you have there. And uh, what else? I can do the exact same logic here. So this polynomial minus 1, um, it should have exactly that many roots. And again, that's just another application where that's my new d here. Again, see the previous video for that. So uh, now what can we count is how many elements are there um, such that a raised to the qi to the ni is equal to 1, but maybe 1 less than that power is not equal to 1. So we can count how many elements that there are. There should be qi to the ni minus qi to the ni minus 1. And what is that equal to? You could factor that a little bit and you get this. Remember that counts how many elements a are in this ring z mod pz. Again, such that qi to the ni is an exponent that will give you 1, but anything less than that won't give you 1. So what does that say then? Well, if nothing less than that gives you 1, then that means that uh, what qi to the ni must be the first exponent you run into that you raise a2 to get 1. That's another way to say that each of these a's has order qi to the ni. Uh, and now the last thing for you know each one of these numbers, 1 through r, so in other words, I could apply this logic to each prime factor, or to each prime power in the factorization. So I could apply that logic to each one of those here I could pick an element of that order. And now what I'll do is I'll define a new element by just multiplying all those ones that I picked. So like a1 has order um, q1 to the n1, and a2 has order q2 to the n2, and etc. So then in particular, all of these things have an order that are relatively prime to each other, and now I can just apply the previous proposition that says when the orders are relatively prime, then the order of the product should be the product of the orders. And that's exactly what we're going to have here. So the order of this product, A, should be equal to the product of the orders, but I know that that is equal to P minus 1. Remember the Q's were chosen so that that's the factorization of P minus 1. And so what does that tell me? We just said that A is an element of order P minus 1, which is the order of Z mod P Z star. That's equivalent to saying that A is a primitive root mod P. Remember that's phi of P. So we found an element of order phi of P. Uh, they do in a little example here, so illustrate the proof of that when p is 13, say. Um, so p minus 1 would be 12, and look at the prime factorization of 12 is 2 squared times 3. And uh, now let's look at 2 squared is the first thing, so I see 2 to the, f or x to the fourth minus 1 is the first polynomial that I consider, and I see it has these four roots here. And uh, uh, what else do I see? I see that uh, x to the second minus 1 has roots 1 and 12. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to take my first root to say be 5. So I'll take it that one. And then now I'm going to do the same kind of game with uh, polynomial x cubed minus 1. It has roots 1, 3, and 9. And we'll take 3 in that one. So in particular, if I look at the, the uh, element 5 times 3, that's 15, which is equivalent to 2. That's guaranteed to be a primitive root. That's guaranteed to have order 12. And so to verify that, um, we could just keep computing these powers of 2 until I get to 1. There should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So 12 is the first exponent I raised 2 to in order to get 1 in z mod 13z. Just be careful. If p is, uh, I guess, a power of 2 that's bigger than 4, then none of that stuff works. And again, that's why we're sticking to the case where um, p is a prime here. So like I know that from a previous video, there's four elements in z mod 8z star. Um, and each one has an order dividing 2, but 5 of 8 is equal to 4. So there is no primitive root there. 
So maybe that leads to um, when do you get primitive roots mod p to the n? So let's let p to the n be a power of an odd prime. So we're not talking about powers of 2. Well, then in these rings also, uh, there is a primitive root modulo p. So in something like in, uh, say, z mod 9z star, right? 9 is a power of an odd prime 3. This thing has a primitive root. And for any odd prime power, so also something like z mod uh, 125z, right? That's 5 cubed. That thing has a primitive root. So we can kind of build on this idea that, okay, z mod p z star always does, but also z mod p to the n z star has one, as long as p is an odd prime. And so the last thing is, well, how many primitive roots should you expect to have? Um, the number of primitive roots. So if you're in a particular group that has a primitive root mod n, then I can tell you exactly how many there are. There are phi of phi of n of them. So there are phi of phi of n primitive roots mod n. And so far, what do I know? Well, I know the primitive roots by the above. Those should just be the generators of this group, z mod n, z star. And what we also know is, what does that mean? That means that this is cyclic, and I know how many elements are in here. By definition, there are phi of n elements in here, right? We're just counting. These are the units mod n, and I know that there are phi of n numbers that are relatively prime to n, that are less than or equal to n. Now, this next thing is a little bit about group theory, where, in fact, Structurally, everything really just looks like like z mod, say, kz, where k is some integer. Every cyclic group of order k really looks like z mod kz. Um, in other words, the only thing that's different from one group that's cyclic of order k from another group that's cyclic of order k is just how you label the elements. Maybe a fancy way to say this, or some books might say, up to isomorphism, they all look like z mod kz. So in particular, um, what have I got? Well, here's one group of order. This thing is cyclic of order phi of n. And so what I'm saying, it should also, it should look like, it should be in bijection with, is a more forceful way to say that. So I almost wrote down forceful. It's in bijection with just z mod phi n z, right? This thing is another cyclic group that's additive with uh, phi of n elements in it. So they both have the same number of elements, and if you agree that really as far as labels go, there's only one thing that has phi of n elements and is cyclic, then these things are in bijection with each other. Uh, so in particular, and of course this I'm thinking of the additive group here. So in particular, well like uh, this has phi of n elements in it, and uh, what are the generators of this thing? So if I asked you like what are the generators of something like, uh, how about z mod i got to think about this for a second. Z mod uh, 6z. The generators of that are uh, what? 1. 1's definitely a generator. And 5. 5 is another generator. Because uh, what can I get? If I start adding 1 to itself, I can recover the other elements, 0 through 5. And if I start adding 5 to itself, I can recover the other elements, 0 through 5. So in particular, what else do you notice about how many generators are there? There's 2. 5 of 6 also happens to be 2. So to count the number of generators in z mod 6 z star, that's also just 5 of 6. Cool. And so what did we just do? We just showed that the, an element in here, it has order 5 of n whenever it's co-prime to n, right? That's my 1 and 5 above. And to count that, what did we do? We should just take 5 of 5 of n. So that's why there's that many elements there. So to, to give another example here, um, there are phi of phi of 17. Well, I know phi of 17 is just one less because 17 is prime, so phi of 16. And there's a formula that tells me how to break that down. That's phi of 2 to the 4th. That should be 2 to the 4th minus 2 cubed. That'll count how many uh, numbers are relatively prime to 16. So there should be 8 primitive roots mod 17. And uh, here they all are. You can do a similar computation with uh, phi of 9 as well.